the Bible says that God knew us before we were in our mother's wombs. Now, um, in most cases, uh, certain things happen to us and you wonder, you ask yourself, why is this happening to me? Why am I supposed to go through this? Do I even have a reason to live? Uh, before you ask yourself such a question, an answer is here. Now, today we are blessed as we welcome you to my story. It's a pleasure having you tuned in. Uh, yeah, I'm already excited because our guest today is really an amazing guest. <laughs> I know you could be asking yourself why and why I chose that particular scripture. Of course, we are blessed to have uh, this particular person. She's a minister of the gospel and uh, passionate about leadership. But she, uh, recently she launched her book, which is called, called Destiny. Mm. Destiny, uh, discovering destined, destined, uh, discovering your pathways to your purpose as a person in this world. The purpose, the God given purpose, the reason as to why you live. Please, uh, this is none other than Miss Irene Kauma. She's an under secretary and the uh, private secretary to the first lady and the ministry of education and sports of course she has a lot of things she works on and uh, out of this story i believe uh by the time we conclude you'll have a reason to say yeah i should now start looking out for my purpose especially if you have troubles in discovering your purpose the answer is yet here in this show please uh join me as we welcome mrs irene kauma it's a pleasure having you this particular evening and thank you so much for really giving us this opportunity to share with us uh kindly greet our viewers who are watching us this evening thank you so much it's a great honor for me to be here good evening viewers so we want to get to the story of Irene, mm -hmm. the little Irene, mm -hmm. where were you born, mm -hmm. how was life as mm -hmm. we were growing up, because mm -hmm. that is really very, very important. Mm -hmm. mm. I was born f over 50 years ago. I know ladies don't like to say their age, <laughs> but I have no problem saying that. Okay. You're and one, I keep, of, uh, I, one in the few. One of <laughs> <laughs> and I keep saying that as Uganda grappled with the aftermath of the Idi Amin coup, in 1971 somewhere in eastern Uganda a very young girl a 14 year old girl faced the trauma of her life as she struggled with this very unwanted pregnancy everybody told her you must get rid of that and go back to school but she carried her baby to full term okay. and that baby was me so my coming into the world was not celebrated at all. No wonder I can't find a, a picture of myself as a baby. I was very unwanted. And even when I came, everybody tried to kind of not come to terms with my fatherhood, you know, who had fathered me. They wanted my mother to say it is so and so. So I honor my mother very much that at 14, she had the courage to go against all the odds, raise me. She was a child herself. Yeah. So my first years, my formative years, mm. I was with my grandmother, my maternal. Grand, maternal grandmother, her mother. Mm. My grandmother was the first godly person I came to know. She was my first best friend. She was my first pastor. She was my first everything. She was a born again Christian, and so she raised me. She taught me to love Jesus. She taught me to love people. She accepted me wholeheartedly, despite the circumstances, the complicated circumstances, okay. yeah, that surrounded my birth. Mm -hmm. And so, my first years, I was in a little village called Bliansime mm -hmm. in Iganga district, mm -hmm. now called Bugweri district. And my mother left and got married yeah, to somebody in uh, my step my stepfather mm. in Kaliro. So Kaliro I did district. Kaliro district. Mm. So I didn't have the luxury of going to kindergarten. I just went to P1 to a small school in in Kaliro. Uh, my stepfather was transferred to Kamuli, 
and so I came to Kamli Township. How old did, did you join school? Peace. I was six, I think. Okay. Six, yeah. So I later went to Kamli Township. Township and did P2 and P3. And guess what? Mm -hmm. In 1979, my father came. All this time he had been in exile in Nairobi. So in 1979, he comes, he was now part of the campaigns with uh, President Obote. Mm. So he comes to our little house in Kamuli, and he arrives. My father was a handsome, he passed away in 1996. Mm. He was an honorable man, very handsome, very intelligent, very pleasant. I remember the first time I saw him as a child, I was wow <laughs> he had a big group of people he came with typical of all politicians he was on a campaign trail mm. so he came with this group of people he entered the house he lifted me sat me on his lap, looked at me and from that time on something i had longed for mm. a connection to a father that mm. i had in me unknowingly you mm. know was formed there and then i felt oh my father loves me my father is here. Mm -hmm. But then he went away immediately. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking, yeah, he was on a campaign okay. train, so he okay. left. I remember looking myself in the bathroom and crying for hours because this connection that I had longed for so mm -hmm. much had been made and broken immediately. immediately. But God is a faithful God. That wouldn't be the end. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1980, he came back into the country and he was here as a minister from 1980 to 1985. And so I had the opportunity to see him, to receive his love, to, 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 to receive that longing, the affirmation that I longed for from him from time to time. Okay. Yeah, so that was my, my childhood. And after, actually when he came in 1979, he promised he was taking me to a better school, mm. a better primary school. <laughs> so in 1980, yeah. I joined Buckley High School. In Iganga mm. still, from P4 to P7. Mm -hmm. And Buckley was another great experience. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful <laughs> girls' school. We were young. From Kamali Township. From Kamali to Township, <laughs> yes. We were young, we were gullible, we yeah. were. Those were difficult times, by the way. Mm. There was a lot of starvation in the country, so we fed on yellow portion. On, on beans that had weevils mm. and all that. So we starved a lot. We ate strange fruits on the compound. But I just remember that it was a very beautiful time of community mm. with the young people. But one thing that, um, and, and one of my friends can't stop talking about that, Dr. Jane Fabsikwa, mm. I shared a decker with her. We are still friends <laughs> up to today. So she says that, um, and this is true, we had all these fears uh, people said they saw a mzungu in the main hall dancing at night. They saw a, um, a mzungu climbing a tree on his back. They said there were some demons. We called them Bukala Banda, which walked in the in the in the in the dormitory. So, so the, the story of Bukala Banda is not a new story. It's not a new story. We feared. We covered our heads. Some ch ch some of the students shouted at night because they insisted they were seeing some strange beings. Up to today I ask myself, were there some real demonic forces that really tormented our innocent souls? Or were these hallucinations, <laughs> imaginations? Because we feared so much. And as a result of that, many of us feared to go out, you know, in the night. So there was a lot of bed waiting in our dormitories. <laughs> and uh, some, <laughs> some of us couldn't sleep on top of the deckers because our problems were bigger when it came. At night, our problems were really big, mm. so we had to sleep down. And, and so, it, it's, apart from that, the, it was a beautiful place. Our head teacher was called Mrs. Issa Virie. I honored her at my book launch mm. because she was amazing. I, I wish teachers knew the power that they have over us, mm. over our lives. Mrs. Issa Virie knew my complicated situation. Mm. I learned later. So for some reason, she had keen interest in me. Mm. In the evenings, I went to her home to drink milk. Mm. She looked out for me. My father was a minister then. Mm. So when he came to see me, she came to him. The matron came. Mm. 
the, the teacher on duty came. So it felt nice to be the minister's daughter. Mm. I would have many visitors mm. on one because my you know my mother wasn't living with yeah. him. So my father my mother would arrive probably very early in the morning, mm. carried on the back of a bicycle mm. or walking mm. into the compound, brought some grub, then um, he would come towards the end of the day. Mm. Uh, there was a, a time when my grandmother came wow. with her friend. Wow. So for me, I have very fond memories of mm. Buckley mm. High School. Mm. Yeah, I don't know why it's called high school when it's a primary school, <laughs> but it's called Buckley High School. I, I'm also learning now that it is a primary school. It's a primary I've school. I've already thought it is a secondary school. No, 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 school. it's a primary school, but it's called Buckley High School. Yeah. yeah. So after Buckley, mm. I went to, I, my mother wanted me to go to Namasagari. Mm. Badly. Huh? That time Father Grimes was it. In Busoga there, we saw all these Namasagari girls in their short red dresses and the, 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 the older ones were in trousers, you know. And ah, my mother wanted me to go to Namasagali and dragged me to the interview. And Father Grimes did select me. She was so sad. So I went to Wanyange Girls School. But I want to believe that God wanted me to be in Wanyange. Okay. Guess what happened to mm -hmm. me when I got to Wanyange mm -hmm. Girls School? I met my heavenly bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. At the age of 13, wow. I was betrothed to him. Wow. And that changed the trajectory of my life. We, we, we are uh, more interested in that story. Uh, how do you meet uh, this? I, this heavenly bridegroom. Heavenly bridegroom. Ooh, <laughs> I love him. Um, it was Independence Day mm. on 9th October. Uh, 1984, mm. as an S1, we had gone into town. You know how you go for independence to march, mm. different schools. Mm. And so we come back in the evening and I see the girls, the saved girls I admired. One of them was called Annette Wanyana. The other one was Oliver Beatrice. And another one was Florian, was Rose Ofono. They were saved girls. They were respected. Annette Wanyana was top of her class every term. She was the chapel prefect. I admired Annette. So when I saw her in the vestry, just near the dining, and they were singing and preaching, I just opened the door, and I said, I want to give my life to Christ. Just like that? Just like that. But you know what? Yeah. My grandmother had sowed the seed. Oh, yeah. My grandmother loved Jesus. Mm. She used to sing songs. You would think she'd sing Jesus. Okay. She would sing San Yukirech Gambo Chino, Anjagala, Yesu Anjagala, Tukutendereza Yesu. So she had really introduced me to Christ. Mm. Just that I had never verbalized and said, you know, she had not taken me through the sinner's yes. prayer. Yes. So what Annette and her friends did that day is to take me through the sinner's prayer. But I believe my heavenly bridegroom had kept this loving eye on me <laughs> since, hmm. since that time. Hmm. So it wasn't a hassle for me to say, here I am. I want you to come into my life. Oh, no. Now, because I'm an extrovert, hmm. as soon as I gave my life to Christ, uh. I began to preach. Uh, Ask me what I was preaching. Uh -huh, what were you preaching? I would hear what Annette would preach <laughs> and come and preach it <laughs> and quote uh. wrong scriptures. <laughs> I would stand up and say, Job chapter 70. <laughs> and Paul said, there is no chapter 70 in Job. <laughs> I'd stand up and say, Matthew chapter 50. <laughs> and I'm corrected. But I didn't care. I wanted to be like Annette. The fire was too The much. fire in my heart. Mm. I loved Jesus. Mm. I wanted to preach. I wanted to do something for him. Mm. And at that time, there was so much fire. The fellowship was on fire. The uh, Many students said they had seen Apostle Paul. <laughs> I don't know how they knew he was Apostle Paul. Others said they saw Apostle Peter. Mm -hmm. And all these apostles were saying that Jesus is coming back. Mm. So me, I had to preach because Jesus was coming. I needed to rescue souls mm. from hell. Mm. I remember going back for holidays. I told my grandmother, I don't want to waste time at school. Jesus is coming back. Mm. I want to get out of school and preach the gospel. Mm. She said, calm down, my little girl. <laughs> <laughs> if you complete school, you'll have more people who will want to listen to you. Mm. But if you drop out now... Mm. Probably very few people who will want to hear you out. Because my grandmother was a teacher and my grandfather, so they knew the importance oh, of education. Sure. So she refused. She said, you can't. Mm. 
you cannot and then i told her okay can you tell the reverend that i should be the one to preach on sunday mm. she said no are you mad what are you going to preach? I say, I know the story of Noah. Mm. I know how people were marrying and drinking and mm. then the flood came. Mm. So I want to warn these people not to, to, to you know, because Jesus is coming. This was so serious. I know. And my <laughs> grandmother said, no, 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 you can't. I'll not even tell the reverend about that. But you know, Today, mm. I keep saying, when I go to that church, that village church, mm. even if the reverend sees me passing around, he'll say, do you want to preach? <laughs> My grandmother is long dead. So for me, that just shows purpose. Yes. That we, we come with the passion. Yes. We come with the gifts. Mm. We come with a personality mm. for a particular assignment sure. on the earth. Sure. So what happened now back at Wanyangi, mm. with my zeal, mm. preaching, quoting so many wrong scriptures, <laughs> They told me, now you're the S1 representative on the committee. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. I embraced that with so much energy. Mm -hmm. Soon after that, the school appointed me that, the timekeeper. Mm -hmm. ah. After that, guess what? Mm -hmm. I was now the chapel prefect. Hey. I was heading the scripture union. Mm -hmm. My God, I sang, I preached, I testified. There's nothing I didn't do. Now today I look back. And I realized that was the beginning of my leadership sure, journey. Sure. That was my destiny maker mm -hmm. at work. Mm -hmm. That was a journey of destiny mm -hmm. beginning in this innocent life. Sure. Who, this uh, little girl who had just found her heavenly bridegroom, mm -hmm. had just found the lover of her soul mm -hmm. and was ready to give everything. But I'll tell you something. Mm -hmm. Even as I preached, and I was at the front, deep within me, I felt very unwanted. I felt very incompetent. I felt very inadequate. My question was always, am I wanted? But because I have a, a, a strong personality mm. and I'm jovial, mm. I'm always at the front. And no one will ever and know And nobody the will ever know. I remember my friends now tell me, that when they wouldn't come for fellowship, I would stop talking to them for months. Hey. Yes. I don't know if I was fighting God's battles or what, but I was just a wounded person mm. who had been cast mm. out there into leadership without really getting healed mm. from the pain of rejection that I experienced as a child, mm. from the fear that I experienced. I think that's why my heart is to those who are weak, to those who are wounded, to those who are rejected, to those who do not feel they are enough, because I know what it means. You've been there. I have been there. So school ended at uh, one younger girls with all my baggage inside, but powerful. After senior four or senior six? After senior four. Okay. I was powerful in public, mm. but very miserable privately, mm. very fearful, mm. very timid, very inadequate on my own, wondering whether people liked me, wondering whether they appreciated me. Mm. And uh, I went to Namasagali now, finally. Finally. For senior five and senior six. Mother must have been happy. Yeah, she then. was happy. <laughs> and in Namasagali, mm. there was no scripture union. The first time we listened to Father Grimes, he said, I hate my locally, and if you am locally, keep it to yourself. <laughs> so all our fellowships were, you know, were, were, we, we, we prayed, mm. we gathered uh, in, in different rooms and prayed. We participated in the Anglican church, but it wasn't like we were mm. in Wanyange. Mm. But sir, I believe that God allows us to go to test the authenticity of yes. what you believe. Yeah? Where there is no one telling you go for scripture union, mm. come and preach. We ha our faith had to be tested. Yeah? We had to be sure that we actually loved this bridegroom. Mm. Yes. Because everything worked against our faith. But we persevered and went through that. But again, in Namasagali, I learned my, my, my esteem, my self-esteem grew. Because of the way in Namasagali, Father Grimes didn't believe only in academic work. Yeah, You had to participate in debates. You had to participate in swimming. You had to participate. Co-curricular activities were actually more valued 
So even if you are first in history, in literature, in what, but you did not swim, you did not <laughs> participate in drama, mm. you did not sing, they didn't even read your name. Eh. Yes, you had to balance. This was serious. Yes, you had to be good academically, but and also good in co-curricular. In co-curricular. I think that is one thing missing out. In yes. The so Father Grimes trained us in things that other schools don't train. Mm. Father Grimes trained us to look people straight in the eye when talking to them. Mm. He taught us etiquette. He taught us how to sustain a conversation with a stranger, mm. how to give a firm handshake. Mm. These are things that are not taught, yeah. but he taught those things to us. But one thing that I loved about Namasagali, mm. he had the remedial classes, he called them remedial English, and conference every Sunday, where he taught us those things, the etiquette, looking straight in the eyes and all that. And he would tell us, I still remember some of the things he would tell us. There's something he always said, he said, don't go through life scared and wondering what other people think about you. He said, everybody is busy thinking about what others think about them. <laughs> so in the end, nobody is thinking about you. <laughs> exactly. So live your life. Mm. Live your life. Sing your music. Do what you want to do, you know. Mm. And he also had a different system. Judicious, you know, most schools have prefects, yes. head girls. And in Namasagali, we had ribs. Those were like the police mm. who arrested you if you did something uh -huh. wrong. Uh -huh. And that ranged from style, if you are not dressed neatly, if mm. your hair was not well combed, <laughs> to lack of community participation, to uh. moody moody. If you are the mm. kind who is always moody, not <laughs> laughing at all, not mixing, it was a crime. The police would arrest you. Then mixing levels. He wondered, why would you be an S6 student mm. and your best friend is an S1? There's a problem. Mm. Why can't you re relate with your peers? Mm. Those seemed like small things, but I think they gave us life skills. Sure, sure, sure. And then if you are arrested by the Reeve, mm. you had an opportunity to defend yourself in court. Mm. There was a court. We had a, 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 a lady chief justice. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we well, had well, judges. Was this a student or? Students. Okay. The Reeves were students. Mm. We had judges. We had a cabinet. Mm. Then we had a lady chancellor and the mm -hmm. Lord Chancellor. Mm -hmm. I remember our year, the Lady Chancellor was uh, Miss Olive, Mrs. Olive Lumonia, mm -hmm. who is now the Deputy Director of Civil Aviation Authority yes. and also a uh, Chairperson of USO. Yeah. I was a judge. Yes, hey. I was a judge. Uh -huh. I was a Credit Commissioner. I helped to put together people's cr uh, cr points <laughs> from their co-curricular activities. Hey. So as a Credit Commissioner and I was a judge. So that also um, motivated me to participate. I sang in the choir. I learned. I didn't. I had never fallen in water, but in two weeks I learned how to swim. Yes, because you had to participate. And I thank God. And how would you award the others without you participating? Yes, how do you award? And yes, so I, I did all that. I, I was. I was active because it was a must. Yes. Now I thank God that it was a must. So what about the other wound? Uh, that you had was it now starting to heal um i'll get to that okay. the time when that that starts to okay. heal so um why i say that our esteem was really helped mm -hmm. our confidence levels were boosted in namasagali if you were arrested even for style you went to court and defended yourself you stood up and defended yourself before a judge so that was confident that was confidence building yeah you don't just uh, you don't act you don't play victim mm. you stand up and speak out and that's a skill that many namasagali old students have yeah they will do they will act they will be tv hosts they will mm. do anything True. because somebody nurtured that yes. and we are forever grateful to father grimes and our teachers sure. in namasagali college mm. when i finished namasagali all that time i had my pains my woundedness mm -hmm. I remember I even wondered whether I'm smart in that short dress. We used to wear shorts. I was so conscious of myself. I was so conscious of being in the trouser, all because of my own woundedness yes. and rejection and lack of affirmation. And so, in S6 VAC, mm. I got a scripture unions conference. A scripture union. Yes, scripture union Uganda. Yeah, scripture union Uganda. Mm. 
we went to a conference. That conference was at Kira College Butiki, if I remember well. Yeah, Kira College Butiki. And we found a couple at that conference. It was a, a, a white couple. And they told one thing throughout the conference, rejection. Mm -hmm. The root of rejection, the manifestations of rejection, and how to heal from rejection. They explained the things that we go through that open us up to the spirit of rejection. Mm -hmm. They talked one thing that I remember vividly. They said, a father is a source of security. A father is the assurance of a home to a child. A father is a provider. So they said, when a child grows up without a father, they grow up very insecure. They grow up feeling lost. They grow, a father is a source of identity. We carry our father's names. So they are the source of our identity. So they said, when you grow up without this father present, affirming you, loving on you, you grow up a very insecure being. And they said, rejection manifests in many ways. For some of us, we become aggressive. Some withdraw. Some become workaholics because you're trying to fill a void. And for some, we get into what Joyce Meyer calls approval addiction. Yes. You think you have to work hard to be approved. You work hard at friendships. You work hard at relationships. Sometimes you suffocate people because you feel you're not worth loving. So you must earn people's love. Yeah? yeah? Then fear is another result of that. Because of that lack of security, you grow up very fearful. And I used to bite my nails, almost blood would come. So they mentioned all those things, that the habits that come out of fear, timidity, and they express themselves in different ways. So at that conference, for the first time, somebody diagnosed my sickness and prescribed okay. the medicine. Uh, we are going to take a short commercial break and when we return, we are going to now talk about the prescription. Thank you. You are still watching my story here on Church of Uganda Family TV. Thank you so much. Uh, we are in our second part of this show. This is an amazing show and we are on the journey of understanding and uh, identifying and knowing our purpose. So you shouldn't really miss this part. I actually, if uh, you were watching alone, inform someone else to watch because they are yet to miss out if you do not encourage them to watch. We are with Mrs. Irene Kauma, who is the book author of Destined, an amazing book. Of course, later we shall talk about this book, but we are still getting into her story. As someone who grew up a rejected person, she has carried this burden in the public, she's smiling and everyone thinks everything is okay. But what happens when she's in her private, the burden of rejection? And she, went, she goes to a scripture union conference where they diagnose her and they give her a prescription. Mrs. Irene, yes. we are back from the break. Uh, Thank you, Adrian. You're with you're in this conference, they have diagnosed you. Uh, what were some of the signs, apart from the nails uh, you were biting? What other signs did you have? Anger. Anger outbursts. I told you I would stop talking to people. Because they didn't come because for fellowship. Because they didn't come for fellowship. Can you imagine that? Then, much as I was jovial, it was very hard to relate to me. It was yeah. easy to relate to me. I had many friends, but no one could come close. I feared to be hurt, so I put walls to protect myself. The other one was the insecurity. I felt so small. I was the chapel prefect, I was the scripture union chairperson, but deep within me, I felt so small. I always ask myself, am I enough? Am I a mistake? Am I wanted? I felt inadequate. Nobody could tell, and people would tell me, you do this so well. And I would say, thank you, but deep within me, I didn't believe it. I admired other people so much. 
I admired other people. I thought I was, I didn't look good enough. Because I'm light skinned, I thought being dark was better. I'm tall, so I thought maybe being Big short shirt, was yeah. better. I remember somebody told me, you're tall. You're so tall. And I began to walk <laughs> like this. I'm telling you, wow. I, ha I had to learn to walk straight. It took me time to learn to walk straight. That is all the, the, the feeling small, mm. not appreciating who you are. That identity crisis, yeah, yeah. those things are real. And you cannot give people what you don't have. Exactly. If you feel small, you can't be an encourager. Sure. If you're wounded, you wound others. Mm. Hurting people hurt others. Yeah. yeah. So for me, that was the first. After the 9th October 1984, mm. when I met Jesus, yes. this was the next biggest def destiny defining moment. Understanding why I behaved the way I did. Mm understanding why I felt so small, understanding why I always compared myself to others, understanding why I had to work hard to perform, even at a friendship, mm. you know? If somebody was my friend, if they didn't talk to me, I thought I had wronged them, I thought I, if I had carried all that baggage up to now, probably I would be dead. So at that conference, Many things were said. There were other speakers. Mm. But for me, this is what God wanted me to hear. Exactly. And I became a reader from that conference because they referred me to books to read. The Father Heart of God, mm. The Root of Rejection, um, Beauty for Ashes. And I began to read. Up to today, I read. I'm a reader. Mm. But it started at that conference. Mm. I became a student of the Word of God. Because I remember them telling me, what are the lies you have believed? Mm -hmm. That you're not beautiful, that you're not good enough, mm -hmm. that you won't amount to anything, mm -hmm. that for you, you have to work hard to be liked. Mm -hmm. And they told me, you have to replace those lies with the truth of God's word. So that meant I had to read my Bible exactly. and find those truths mm -hmm. to counter the lies mm -hmm. that I had believed for years mm -hmm. and pretended that I was okay. And I have this burden in my heart, Adrian. When we come to Christ and we say that sinner's prayer, mm. then they tell us, you're now a new creation. Yes. You're a new creation. Mm. So we start to be a new creation. But we are hurting. Yeah. We are wounded. Mm. We don't know who we are. How can we be a new creation? So I want the church to talk to people about their pain, mm. about their woundedness. Mm. People outside there, Go to therapists yes. and talk through pain mm -hmm. and talk through grief. Mm -hmm. For us here, the way we handle pain is by talking about other people's pain. True. If you're going through a bad marriage, mm -hmm. look for another one going through a bad marriage and exactly. keep talking about theirs. <laughs> that is our therapy. Yes. But it doesn't change your situation. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Yeah. We have to face the pain at the cross. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, from that time, I understood that there is a place where pain is powerless. There is a place where shame is powerless. There is a place where rejection is powerless. And it's at the cross. It's at the cross. There is a man who took our shame. There is a man who took everything that was supposed to be ours. He became a curse. He was rejected that we might be accepted. He became poor, that we might be rich. Yeah? He took out, he, he, he was ashamed, he was nailed. Yeah, yeah. naked, mm -hmm. to cover our nakedness. Yeah. So I found that at that place, at the cross, shame is powerless. But it's a process, it is a process. That process began then. Mm. I keep telling people, maybe I still have some of those issues. Mm. Maybe I still feel insecure. There are things that cause me insecurity. Mm. But I'm not where I used to be. You know that when you diagonize a problem, you are able to deal with it. Yes. The problem is when you live without knowing you have a problem. Exactly. 
when and you think everything is okay. It's okay. Mm-hmm. And you know we are in a society where people don't give us honest feedback. Yeah. People give us supportive feedback. Exactly. They say, oh, you did well. <laughs> Instead of saying, no, you were just shouting in the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? <laughs> so, Very true. So we, 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 we must... We don't many times don't have the opportunity to actually get to know. Yes. It has to take God Himself, and you have to walk through that pain with the Holy Spirit. I remember sitting with that couple for a long time, and I went through my story. They asked me questions. They said, "We want you to visit this place here of pain with the Holy Spirit. Visit it with the Holy Spirit." Now they asked me questions. How do you feel about God the Father? You know, we are in church, but many of us shout God is good, but we don't actually believe it's good. Exactly. We don't. It is many like a us, common saying. It's like a common saying. Mm. Many of us have a lot of offense against God because of what we have been through. So they took me through all that and said, do you carry any offense against your father in heaven? And I realized I did. They said, how do you feel towards your earthly father? How do you feel towards your mother? How do you feel towards... Yeah, and for me that was very important. I remember leaving that conference with energy, with genuine joy. Mm-hmm. I went home, I would sing worship songs for hours. My mother thought I was losing my mind. How long was the conference? The conference, I think, was just a week. Okay. Yeah, those scripture you know, conferences are not, yeah, it was a week. Yeah, but it was such a turning point in my life. And I look back and I'm thinking how many children are walking around feeling unwanted. I had a story of, uh, 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 I think it was Father's Day, and they gave cards to some inmates in a prison. And they said, write a message to your father. And they found the cards. Nobody had written. So they realized that actually most of these people in, in that particular prison either didn't have a father or didn't have a relationship with a father. So family was meant to be the place of love and affirmation for us, but for many children it became the place of pain. Exactly. Many people have been deeply wounded in the family. Sure. And this doesn't have to do with only those of us who are born outside marriage, outside wedlock. You could be born in a home with a father and mother who are wedded, and even ch- going to church. But there are things that can happen to you in that home True. that wound you. True. That wound you. In Husoga, where I, came, I come from, polygamy is one thing that has wounded many families. Yeah? Polygamy brings so much pain. Polygamy opens the door to witchcraft. Polygamy opens the door to sibling rivalry. Polygamy opens Mystic so violence. many doors. So we carry this package. And for me, I keep telling people, Jesus paid such a heavy price. We must walk in the freedom that he bought for us. We must live the abundant life. So I, my prayer is that we will throw off the shackles of shame will throw off the shackles of pain and live in the freedom that Jesus paid for. Amen. Amen. So after senior six, uh, you have this gift, the, va- the vacation gift. Yes. Uh, you've, you've gotten a prescription yes. for your pain. Yes. Mm. So we leave the conference with one powerful statement. See you at campus. <laughs> <laughs> And that time, there was only one university in Uganda, Makere University. So you either made it to Makere or you went maybe to a technical college or to another tertiary institution. Makere that time took the cream of the cream. Cream of the cream. Yes, because it took just a few. So we leave and we have this pron- faith pronouncement, see you at campus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I go to VAR and the VAR comes to an end, mm. results come back, mm. and lo and behold, I'm missing my career by one point. Uh. One like this. One. You know what happened towards our, I was doing really well, mm. 
I, I do the art subjects extremely well and mm. with minimum effort. Mm. It is the sciences that I fail to do completely, apart from biology, agriculture, mm. physics, chemistry, <laughs> math. <laughs> up to today, they are like Gujarati to me. <laughs> so, but I do history, mm. literature, mm. English, geography mm. with minimum effort. And I was doing history, literature, and divinity. And I was doing extremely mm. well. Then one day, Father Grimes came back from Kampala and said, you know, guys, you need to add a fourth principle if you're going to make it, because we have one university. Mm. So to make it, if you have four principal subjects, you know, you stand a higher chance. Mm. So I added economics to my history, literature, and divinity with two terms to go. That was the worst decision I ever made. I failed the economics, but also it affected my grades mm. in these three subjects mm. that I was doing well. So I'm there and I'm missing by one mm. point. My joy almost crashed that I had carried from the conference. conference. Mm. Guess what? Guess what? Mm -hmm. My destiny designer was at work. Mm -hmm. That year, mm. government gave 1.5 points to every female student eh. as an affirmative action. Eh. You believe me? 1.5 to every female student. You were missing only one. One. So you have 1.5. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so nobody can deceive me that there is no God, mm -hmm. that there is no destiny designer up mm -hmm. there. There is somebody who knew what I needed to do on earth mm -hmm. and packaged me, wired me to do that and orchestrates everything sure. i only need to cooperate with him mm. yeah because i keep saying that destiny is preordained mm. but your decisions decide destiny mm. so all you need is to cooperate mm. but there is a destiny there is a bright future mm. there's a glorious inheritance mm. god went up to that level to make sure i joined makere so you joined makere i joined makere guess what when i had when I, I, I got admitted, mm. the first person I wanted to break the news to was my grandmother. She was still alive. So I got to the village. I shouted from the road. I said, eh. I have passed. I'm going to Makerere. <laughs> my grand we cried. We hugged. We sang to Kutendere Zayesu. Wow. My grandfather didn't usually express his emotions. Mm -hmm. just sat in his sitting room quiet. That day he also joined us and we shouted. Mm. Hallelujah, and we praise the Lord. Yeah? So, I joined university to do Bachelor of Arts, um, Sociology and Religious Studies. Yes, and I did that very well, left with an upper second honors degree. So again, my destiny designer is at work. Mm. Yes. And Makere was another place of growth for me. They had a very strong Christian union, I'm sorry, I'm told it's no longer there yeah. now, but they had a strong main CU. We had great teachers of the word. We participated in out, we had fellowships at a at, uh, whole level. I was mm. in Africa Hall. Mm. At Africa Hall, I was part of the committee. I was the outreach secretary. We had the freedom to go to any church, to attend any meetings. It was a great, great discipleship space for me. And the three years just, you know, fled like, ooh, we are already <laughs> done with know, this the before three years we knew. <laughs> the three years were over. Mm. And I'm thinking, no, Lord, we still needed to be here a little <laughs> bit. Yeah, so, mm. yeah. So, after Makere, you're now out yes. in the world. After Makere, ah, I'll tell you a story. Something happened to me at Makere. Okay. I fell in love. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> very, very important. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. in, in second year, uh. there's this guy. Mm. Um, we met at church, mm. Deliverance Church. Mm. We were both regular members. Mm. He talked so much, so I didn't like him. I talk a lot, so I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm always attracted to quieter people, mm. more collected people, not those who talk so much like me. Mm. But he pursued me and pursued me, and I fell in love. Uh -huh. Oh, love, in love for the very first time. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I got saved at 13. I had been in a girls' school most of the time. 
And so this was my teacher on everything to do with love. Yeah. It felt good. We escorted each other mm. from Africa Hall to, to, to one day gear for him to take a taxi. We'd escort each other at night like seven times. <laughs> you go to the stage, come back, go, come back, go, come back. We'd stand around Africa and talk. Mm. You people, love is beautiful. Sure. It is beautiful. Sure. <laughs> so I finished university. Mm. I go to volunteer at Kagogo Community Improvement Project in uh, Chiboga mm. district. And at that time, he gets a scholarship to go for a PhD to the US. It was good news, but it was terrible mm. news. I wondered, will he come back? Mm. He said, to show you that mm. I'll come and marry you, mm. let me visit your parents. Mm. He visited my parents. It wasn't Akuchala, mm. it was Akwanjula. Mm. He brought so many things. He came with so many people. I escorted him to the airport. And guess what he said? Mm. He said, Irene, I've not put a ring on your finger, but I've put a ring on your heart. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. <laughs> I'll come back and marry you. Uh -huh. So my brother, I wait and wait and wait. One year, two years, three years, four five six seven oh. <laughs> i am waiting for the man who put a ring no on my finger no we are communicating okay. Okay. but not the communication of today mm. your instant ones of yes. whatsapp and yes. what uh, letters would come mm. gifts would come i actually had to get my friend's post office key mm. so that i could have access to the post office <laughs> box please <sighs> In the eighth year, I think, of waiting, one of my mentors comes to me and says, Irene, you are wasting prime time. Mm. Is this man coming or are you going? Mm. This is prime time. Mm. All your mates are getting married. What are you waiting for? I said, but the man visited. The man is, is the one I love. Mm. He said, no. No, you can't wait for this long. You know? Anyway, around that time, I got to learn of a scandal that had happened with him where he was in the US. So I let go mm -hmm. of the relationship at that time. But the time wasted. Eight years. The time plus the ones at yes, university. Yes, yes. And I think it's even almost over eight years. Because all that time I was in dreamland. Mm -hmm. So I want to speak to young girls, mm -hmm. single girls in church, mm -hmm. to say, please don't be naive. Mm -hmm. I had I saw so many red flags that I kept ignoring in my naivety mm. and I delayed so much. So I later married very late in life. Because of all that time, those delays should be avoided, my sisters in church. Be wise. Talk to other people. I think the problem is that we just talk between ourselves, saved girls, and mm. we are very, you know, innocent. Girl we are child very talk. Girl. Yes. <laughs> talk to people. And don't just waste time because it's not worth it. Yeah. And so after school, you're asking after school, I did that with the World Vision. I volunteered. I came back to Kampala. My friend, uh, she passed away, Rose Gawaya, had started a, a project called Slum Aid Project. She was settling uh, commercial sex workers in Katanga region, in Katanga slum. slum. So I joined Slum Aid Project to help, to do that, not to help, she employed me. Mm. She made me her program manager. And then my friend Harriet Modondo had started a hostel in Kampala here called Nile Hostel. So I had two jobs. I was a warden at the hostel mm. and I was working the in Slum Aid, yeah, the program mm. manager of Slum mm. Aid Project. So in that same year, I did interviews with government under uh, women in development it was called ministry of women in development then oh, and uh, now it's called gender ministry of gender labor and social services and i did interviews with immigration i passed both interviews but again god i think orchestrated again my my destiny so i ended up at immigration at the directorate of citizenship and migration control then it was a department and uh I served there for 14 years. I grew through the ranks. By the time I left, I was a principal immigration officer. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, after the 14 years, 
Um, one day I get a call. Mm. Actually, my last two years at immigration mm. were like the peak of my career. I had been, I was appointed to head the last effort revival to uh, issue national identity cards. Mm. That is the effort that became nearer. Yes. So I headed that. I was heading the national identity card project. We did best practice visits to other countries to see how bio, they use biometrics. We went to the US, we went to UK, we went to Rwanda to see their national ID project. We went to Kenya. I was addressing big meetings about this national identity card. I, I mobilized the church to pray for this project. Mm. You know, I knew this was going to be my biggest contribution to Uganda mm. to deliver national identity cards. Mm. So around that time, I get a call. And one of my mentors says, uh, the first lady is looking for an assistant, a personal assistant, and we think you can do this. I said, no, I want to issue IDs. I have been praying. I've mobilized people to pray for this. I must issue IDs. Mm -hmm. Then I had got so much training in immigration I had been to the International Law Enforcement Academy in Botswana. I had been to Turin, to the International Training Center to learn migration. I had got a Shivening Scholarship. I had been to the University of Sussex to learn managing migration. I, you know? I know they're telling you. Yes, so I said, what do I do with all this training in immigration? Mm. So I went to my PS then, Dr. Kagoda, Dr. S.P. Kagoda, and he said, you know, Irene, I am a mechanical engineer. I'm here. I'm a permanent secretary. <laughs> he said, you don't always have to do what you have trained to do. Mm. It's God, you know, who, who, who deploys us. Mm. I remember going to one of my spiritual fathers then, um, Bishop Luko Rombi, and he looked at me and said, Irene, we don't own places of service. It is God who deploys us. You must know when God is deploying you. He deployed you here. The season is over. You don't own it. God has other people to do the <laughs> ideas. I didn't want to hear that. But I sobered up mm -hmm. when he told me that and said, it's God who deploys us. So if God is deploying you elsewhere, open up your heart. Um, I didn't hear from my mentor who called me for months. And I thought something had changed. So God had spoken. Mm. Now I had a call and she said, now we are going to State House. The First Lady wants to see you. So we got there. I had never been to State House in Tebe. I was impressed by this magnificent <laughs> building on the shores of Lake Victoria. And I'm like, woo! But also meeting Mama Janet was exciting. I had admired her from a distance mm. for very long. I had had her pray, very deep prayers yeah. on meeting, on different um, meetings. Yeah. I had had her. I, 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 I remember the time she stood for parliament. She kept saying one word, God spoke to me. Yeah. And that impressed me. I said, ah, at that level, you don't fear to be misunderstood. Yeah. You can really say God spoke to me. So I really admired her. Yeah. But the closest I had come close to her, was when she came to inspect the VVIP at, at, during Chogam. Mm. I had the opportunity to lead the immigration team during Chogam, when we, we held Chogam yes. in 2007. Sure. So she came to look around. I spoke to her, but at a dis that is the closest I've mm. come to her, to, to, to really meet her. But I really admired her. So I beat her. And I just fell in love with her. <laughs> she is so down to earth. She is so real, she is so godly, so collected and humble, and so it became so easy for me to talk to her. Mm. When she asked me, I said, no, me, I've never been a personal assistant. Give me time to go and pray. Yeah. And she said, no problem. You're shocked. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I need to pray about this because I've never been a personal assistant. All I know is immigration work. Instead of thinking of a training, you're thinking of prayer. <laughs> I said, let me go and pray about it. And she said, it's okay. You pray. Take your time. Wow. I said, the other thing, 
I don't want to get out of government because I've given 14 years mm. of my service to, you know, mm. so I don't want to be uprooted and do something different. Say, you can remain uh, in government, you know, as a civil servant, as you serve here, but I don't know how to do that, so I'll send you to the permanent secretariat, office of the prime minister. So she sent me to see Mr. Bijirimana, who was the PS mm. then. So I reached and Mr. Bijirimana had a myriad of questions. Who are you? How did you know the first lady? Where did she find you? I answered. I said, I don't know her much. So I answered everything. Then I told her, and then she's, she's like, so what do we do now? I said, no, I've told her to give me time to pray. He said, are you mad? <laughs> How old are you? How old are you? When a, a request comes from that level, it's not a request. It's a directive. So before I left Mr. Bijirimana's office, he had already written to my permanent secretary at Intern Affairs to release me. He said, this is, this is not, are you mad? How do you tell her the first lady that you're going to pray? Mm -hmm. I said, but That's she's okay also, with so it. <laughs> I said, she, she said, no, whether she's okay with it or no, let me help you. <laughs> <laughs> I thank God he helped me. Because I thought that leading the ID project was a big platform. Mm. I didn't know God was setting me up for a bigger platform. Because for us children of God, what we need is a platform yes. to see his kingdom yes. expand. Yes. To see his kingdom come on the earth. Yes. Working with mama gave me a bigger platform, bigger influence, more interactions, high level interactions. And I believe that God himself moved me from immigration to come and work with Mama Janet. Working with her as a person has been like a university of itself. She's the most authentic person you'll ever find. What you see her do in public is who she is privately. She's a prayerful person. She fears God. She depends on prayer for everything. I keep telling the story of how she was uh, still really new mm -hmm. and we <laughs> she asked me to MC. We were hosting a group of first ladies at mm -hmm. and she said, yeah, can you MC? I said, fine. I had a, a nice new suit, so I spent the day before looking for a kamzo. A kamzo mm -hmm. is, you know what it is? Yes. That little inlet for a suit. Mm -hmm. And so I get one with a lot of lace. Oh, I was feeling so smart. So I walked to her and she said, why are you wearing an undergarment? <laughs> I'm like, where is the undergarment? She said, that is an undergarment. I said, mama, this is a garment. She said, no, it's an undergarment. Can I tell you? I went and checked on the label and realized this was an undergarment. <laughs> Kindly give us a prayer as we wind up this discussion. Father, what a privilege you have given us to be called your children. What an honor. There is no higher calling. There is no greater honor. Your word tells us before we were formed in our mother's wombs, you knew us. You appointed us to be prophets to nations. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to speak about my life. Many wonder why I choose to become vulnerable, but because you have sent us to disciple the nations. You have sent us to bring healing to those who are broken. You've sent us to bring healing to the wounded. So Lord, I ask that the words that we have spoken here today will bring healing in many lives. That our young population will find their purpose. I pray that those who are walking around with an identity crisis, those who walk around feeling unwanted, those who walk around feeling inadequate, will know that they carry your DNA. And therefore, no matter what has happened to them, their destiny predates conception. I pray that we shall all arise. I pray that the professionals of Africa will arise. I pray that this book will be a tool in your hands to heal and to disciple the nations. And I speak a blessing 
over Church of Uganda Family Television for hosting me today. I pray that they will prosper and that many doors will open for them and that their voice, the voice from here, will reach the nations. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Mrs. Irene Kauma. And to you, our viewer, thank you so much for watching this particular uh, episode of uh, my story. And I believe you must have picked out, of course, what uh, deserves you. It is self-service. You pick what is directly uh, concerning uh, your situation. Thank you so much. Edwin Austin Mkalazi is my name. I've worked with Jonah Jal and Brinko Atevika. And in transmission, we have Mumu.